I'm John Kaiser at the Metals Investor Forum in Vancouver taking place May 10, 11, 2024. I am here with Corey Bielik, CEO of Can Alaska Uranium. Corey, welcome to Vancouver. Thank you, John. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Corey, we had, I, I had a Can Alaska Uranium as one of my companies at the Metals Investor Forum in September 2022 after you pulled high grade uh, uranium in the uh, South uh, uh, Corridor 10 uh, structure and in the Pike Zone. And I was quite optimistic that by uh, the start of next summer, we would, you would have figured out where the unconformity uh, uh, would be. It turned out that you didn't deliver the unconformity uh, until uh, February of this year. So what took so long to vector in on the unconformity? Well, John, these deposits are incredibly complex and they can change on you very quickly. So one of the things that geologists and geoscientists have to work on is working out what's controlling that mineralization. So they focused on following up to the unconformity. We did a number of tests at the unconformity and what we saw was almost every hole was mineralized to a certain degree, some very well in the context of the Athabasca model, but not quite the Cigar and MacArthur type grades that we wanted to see and we suspected that we're there the whole time. So it took time to work through that process. The geologists really have to follow their nose work out the structure and figure out where is the best position that you might expect very high grade mineralization to occur. And that's exactly what they spent about 18 months doing is getting to that point. And here we are. We're now on it and um, it sure looks good. Now that mineralization included, uh, I believe, 4.7 meters of 40% uh, U308, which is really, really high. But it was done with a radiometric uh, reading and EU308. Uh, geochemical assays are still pending. How reliable are these radiometric readings? How are they taken? And when can we expect the geochemical assays to arrive? Yeah, great question, John. So the, the radiometric equivalents that we report, the EU308, are from our probe data. So what we use is a mathematical curve to actually back calculate based on the radiometrics the actual estimated grade. These are just estimates, so it's important to know. So when you get these very high grades, it can be hard to handle, can be tricky, but given our backgrounds from Arano and Chemical, we're relatively used to dealing with this on a, on a routine basis. That's the team. So, um, you know, there will be some variability, but it's going to go both ways. Uh, we anticipate that in the high grades, but uh, it's an estimate. And we are waiting for assays. They're almost all in, so we should be getting to it in a few weeks, getting it out to market, and really basically proving that our radiometrics are in essence correct. And um, you know, these spectacular grades are hard to handle if you haven't drilled them before. So literally every single hole that we drill now that's high grade like this, assuming it's gonna continue to move forward, improves our ability to actually back calculate that math and estimate those grades. So it's a process and it's something we need to do with the assays is to tighten that curve down and get even better at what we do. So yeah, it, it, it takes a bit of time to get the assays in get them worked and, uh, and report it back to market. So that will come in due course. So some of the uh, reluctance of the market to push Can Alaska stock mm -hmm. higher is due to uncertainty about this, these uh, radiometric equivalence assays. So when you get assays confirming uh, the grades that you reported, that, that should help the stock more. But I think another thing that's sort of keeping the stock back is you drilled two follow-up holes this winter. One of them overshot because it turns out that the, uh, the basement uh, is, is downdropped a bit, but then the other one snagged the, uh, na nailed the high grade mineralization. But the market still sees this as a single two dimensional fence mm. across uh, a zone that's going to follow that, uh, that structure. When you resume drilling in July, how big are the step up fences that you are going to attempt? And do you feel confident enough about the geometry and trend of this uh, high grade zone at the unconformity? You're right, John. We, it is still basically two dimensional. Uh, so what, one of the first things we need to do is close that fence off and probably close it in both directions. Make sure we understand what's in that two dimension. Then to move out into the third dimension will take some, uh, some effort but we anticipate probably stepping out about 15, 20 meters, either direction, trying to follow where we think that high grade continues and goes. We think we have a handle on it now, pretty good, but we're gonna still have to go out and prove it with a drill bit. And that will be the focus of the summer programs, working out from what we know into the periphery. And this could grow very quickly. I mean, uh, if we continue to hit these high grades um, and we, it becomes predictable, that's exactly what we want to see. And when that happens, it'll become much easier for us. So there is still some work to do to really sort out the third dimension, 
but we're getting there. We're actually pretty close to having it solved. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a fun summer. Now, now uh, the grades are in the same league as MacArthur River, which ultimately was, I think, about 750 million tons. MacArthur II was a million tons of uh, about 16% U3, U308. Um, when, when that was discovered, how long did it take for them to sort out where exactly it was? You were a part of that process way back then in the 80s, weren't you? Well, actually, it was the late 80s. Uh, I was with another company at the time in the oh, early okay. 90s, but I was around when they actually sort of solved the MacArthur puzzle that we're kind of talking about here in terms of its geometry and what it might be. So how the first discovery started at MacArthur is actually about six kilometers away in what they call their P2 main zone. It's just a small zone. Uh, very similar to what we might have at our 42 zone, for instance, as an example. And then they worked their way along that P2 fault, the main controlling structure that ultimately hosts MacArthur River. So they got into several zones. I think it's about seven zones total right now. Zone two is the big one. Zone two is what holds half of MacArthur's resource. I mean, that's 750 million pound resource. Half of it's in an 80 meter by, say, 30 or 40 meter by 40 meter block of mineralization, extremely high grade, as you point out, um, that's 350 million pounds of uranium that would fit within a football field. Just as an example, incredibly small. So it took them time to actually work that geology out. And ultimately what happened with zone two is they didn't know it was there when they went underground. They did not know it because they drilled 10 meters on one side, 10 meters on the other, and nothing between, and that's where zone two sat. So I remember the day when they made the announcement that MacArthur River is much bigger than they think. And they only did that once they went underground and started to drill off on 15 meter centers. Mm. And they found between these two surface drill fences, zone two. And that's really the key to MacArthur, mm -hmm. an incredible high grade pod. And uh, it takes time, it takes patience, it takes years. Um, what you really hope is that you get into that zone sooner than later. And the grades that we're seeing at Pike Zone line up with some of the best at MacArthur River, some of the best at Cigar Lake, some of the best you might see in the core of Arrow, as an example. So we are in that true tier one type environment, and now we have to follow our nose and let the geologists do their job. And that's that's the next steps. Now, as you start delineating the uh, unconformity pipe zone this summer, mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you get an intersection and have your uh, EU308 uh, assays, you'll put out a press release and we're all going to be uh, with our pencil and paper trying to do a three-dimensional picture of this. Uh, how does one, as a back of a napkin type of uh, uh, situation, uh, convert meters and, and specific gravity and all that into a tonnage footprint? And then we can sort of guess our, guess our grade and figure out the rock value. How do you guys in the field go about doing this as you're seeing this core, core come up and, and land in the box? and? Yeah. Your readings. Well, given my time at uh, Eagle Point as chief mine geologist, you get pretty pretty good at doing these types of things. What we call back of the envelope numbers, and that should be what you know retail investors or other investors should be starting to think about. Mm -hmm. So it's very simple. It's length length times width times height. That's it. And then what you need to know is actually the density, uh -huh. the density of that core, and that's something that we're collecting right now through the assay process is actually collecting densities, because that that equates or can equate to how much metal you have within that block. So that's a really important step for us. Um, and we're gonna see some extreme densities. You know, when you have uranium steel, uraninite steel in a box, that's incredibly dense material. And what that means is that in a very small space, just like I articulated with zone two at MacArthur, in a very small space, you will get a lot of contained metal. And that's what really makes these uranium deposits in the Athabasca Basin very special. It's the incredible density of that mineralization, the very, very, pure nature of that uranium. And um, like I say, you can put a lot of pounds of uranium in a very small space. 350 million pounds in the size of a football field, that's incredible. It's also hard to find. So when you find the edges of these things, you get on it, you can actually build out that potential resource very quickly. You know, if we draw another two or three sections like we have right now with the same types of grades, you're already having a conversation where you're in the size of a football field. And that's key, John. This could this could come very quickly. It could come by the fall. And that's what has us really excited that if, if this is truly that tier one asset, it will evolve very quickly. Just like next gen's aero deposit did. They went from that 25 million market cap to two and a half billion in under three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how fast and that's what makes this special. In off, the off, off the top of your head, do you mm -hmm. have a specific gravity for say, typical host rock with 1% 
five percent and ten percent. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it, it's not quite that simple. No, but I think not. I think when you're when you're when you're when you're drilling the grades that we are, you should be expecting things that are somewhere between the the seven eight uh, gravity uh, specific mm, okay. gravity. Okay, so when we're in this ten percent plus, uh, mm -hmm. use six to eight as a specific. Gravity. Yeah, I, th I think that's you know it, it's it, again grain of salt, but you know you're you're certainly not at the regular two and a half. For instance, you're yes, definitely something yeah. more significant, say five plus. So, you know, um, it's very variable, but that's the key. You put a lot of mill in that space very quickly. Now, MacArthur River is at about 600 meter depth. It's being uh, mined, I believe, with a combination of a freezing to deal with the water flow and remote mining mining technology. But your the the, the unconformity is at the 800 and 10 meter depth and, and the whole system that you're exploring is between 700 and 900 meter depth. And there's some people who think, well, maybe you can do it at 600, but you're not gonna be able to do it at that depth. Is this going to be an issue where you have the pike discovery? I, I really appreciate that question, John, because it is something out there that I face all the time in, in these questions. And you know, our unconformity depth there is about 750 meters. So it's about 200 meters deeper than MacArthur River, for instance. Um, what I will say is that, you know, if, if you look around the world where deep deposits are being mined, uh, I'll give you an example in Saskatchewan where the Janssen shaft, BHP's Janssen potash project, their shaft is over a thousand meters through water bearing formations. How did they do it? They froze ahead of that shaft. So basically they use the frozen water to grout the shaft and hold back the water. Um, you know, MacArthur River, when they sunk those shafts, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. So that's new technology or new uses of that technology, mm -hmm. that freezing technology that's come a long ways in the last two decades, um, putting that to good use. So yes, water is a concern. However, um, there's technology now that allows us to hold it back, basically freeze technology. And that uh, that is happening in Saskatchewan at the Janssen Potash Mine and BHPs. Uh, it's also, if you think about Cigar Lake, mm -hmm. they've changed how they mine Cigar Lake. They used to do a freeze curtain over Cigar, then they had the flooding. Yeah. Now they freeze the entire sandstone column from surface down to 420 mm -hmm. meters, an entire frozen block of ice above Cigar Lake, and they're still mining at $33 a pound all in. So I believe, and I'm not an engineer, so bear with me, uh, I believe that freeze technology is the key. And the other thing that we're sort of not appreciating is that Denison is trying to use ISR methods nearby at their Phoenix deposit. And if that works, perhaps you don't need a shaft. Perhaps you move mm -hmm. to a different style of mining like ISR in situ recovery and you don't even have a need to worry about the water. So there's a lot of different things that have happened in the last 20 or 30 years um, that will allow these deposits to be found. The trick is we still need tier one. We still have to be a large deposit, something well north of 100 million pounds. But again, that can come very quickly when you deal with the grades that we're dealing with. And that's that makes it special. If, if ISR can work on high grade deposits like this, uh, would that shorten the timeline for, for development? Well, I think that's yet to be sort mm -hmm. of proven through Denison's work, but I would envision that it would because the surface impact is much less. So I would say that's a distinct possibility that you could shorten the timelines. Uh, right now, you're probably looking at 15 years from discovery through to first production in a, an asset like MacArthur River. Um, not to say that doesn't change too, but today that's sort of the assumption. Um, it just takes time to get through the regulatory process. So anything you can do in there that limits the impact of the environment or the footprint of these mines, MacArthur is very small already in the context of global mining. Um, and it's something to see, it's pretty cool. But I think ISR could be, if it works, could be a potential candidate. But again, you have to be at that unconformity, mm -hmm. not down in the basement. I think you're still looking at more conventional means when you're when you're below that oh, unconformity, is my view. Okay. So lots to be played out there, but I think what it means is that tier one assets will find a way to get developed. Um, mm -hmm. Give an engineer a problem, they will solve it. Now, now can Alaska, um, has been funding this uh, project on 100% basis with chemical letting itself be diluted. Where are you today? And, and given a, a, a current $7.5 million budget for 2024, where might you end up at the end of this year? And, and when can chemical say enough for participating again? Yeah, okay. it's a good question. We currently own 83.3% of the asset. Chemical holds the rest. Uh, they are diluting this year because they weren't funding prior to our good holes. We'll see what happens after that uh, once we go through the budget process for 2025. So we will gain a few more percentage points. I can't give you that number because it's not public, but we are gaining interest in the project with every spend that we 
incur. And we are sole funding this year, so we will be increasing our percentage in this project. And I'm quite happy to do so when we drill grades like this. I mean, you know, if this is a significant asset, every percentage is, has a lot of value. So, you know, we'll see what they do in the budget for 2025. Right now they have no, no ability to come back into the project this year. So we will get that interest by the end of the summer, mm -hmm. by the end of the year of 2024. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're in pretty good shape, gaining interest in what looks like a very good asset. Now, now, the big story in the past decade has been finding a, a basement hosted uh, mineralization, such as the Arrow deposit <clears throat> of next, next gen, uh, which is not covered by sandstone. And the assumption is the sandstone at one point did cover these areas too, because the sandstone is critical for harvesting the uranium in the, by the hydrothermal systems and then depositing them within the basement structures and at, at the unconformity uh, when, it, when it was present. Now you have a large number of other properties stretching all the way from the <coughs> southwest uh, southeast corner of uh, the Athabasca Basin all the way into Manitoba all along this sort of structural trend. Uh, but uh, uh, some of them are farmed out, some are 100%. Um, what's with the ones in Manitoba? What's the relationship of those to the Athabasca Basin? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, they are well away from the base, you know, 100 kilometers plus. Um, but you got to remember, at time of ore formation, with these deposits, 1.6 billion years ago, that sandstone was seven kilometers thick. It's now less than two kilometers thick in the center. So you've eroded five kilometers of sandstone. What that means is that margin in the present day Athabasca Basin was much larger, considerably larger, and stretched, we believe, well out into Manitoba. And there are some sandstone outliers, about 100 kilometers outside from the basin margin mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. that say that's the zero point already. The unconformity is still that close. The other thing is, 15 years ago, we didn't know about Arrow. We didn't know Eagle Point went down to a kilometer. So both these deposits, these basement hosted deposits, Eagle Point and Arrow, going down a thousand meters provides a lot of opportunity to find significant mineralization well out from the margins of the Athabasca Basin, including into Manitoba. Now, that area of Manitoba are the correct basement rocks. It's what we call the Wallston Domain. Mm -hmm. And that's where you find Cigar, MacArthur, Eagle Point, the Sioux deposits, all the Key Lake. They're all within that set of basement rocks connected to that unconformity in the sandstone. And if it was present where those rocks are present in Manitoba, for instance, you have every opportunity to find the lower half, let's say, of an Eagle Point or Arrow, and that's still very significant pounds in the ground and very significant assets. So the geology is correct, and we chase the geology. Um, there's every opportunity for basement roots of these big deposits that we're only just starting to understand in the last 15 years to be present in these jurisdictions. And we were out there when no one else was on that concept about five years ago. And that's why we staked what we did because we, we understood that model. We went out and grabbed the right geology that supports that model. Now we have to go out and work it. And some of that will be done by partners. We'd love to bring partners in to do this work. Um, some of it will be done by us where we think they have the highest priority um, to make a discovery. And that's, uh, that's what we're focused on, John. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I've done an outcome visualization of uh, the MacArthur River deposit, a million tons of 16%, using numbers that Cameco published in the past decade in a technical report, and inflation adjusted them. And when I run those numbers for the sort of uh, 200 ton per day mining rate that they have, I end up with a uh, sort of $6 billion Canadian uh, after-tax NPV using $90, $90 a pound uh, U308. Um, and that, it, unless you have more dilution, that would translate into a $35 future stock price for Can Alaska Rain compared to the 60, 70 cents where, where it is now. Where in the delineation cycle would you feel it is time to spin out all those other projects and just have West MacArthur sitting in Can Alaska waiting for somebody to take it out and develop it? That's a great question, John. I mean, uh, we do have the ability to actually carve out West MacArthur or a piece of West MacArthur. So let's say the Pike Zone asset, if we want, within the joint venture. That takes time. It takes some uh, discussion with our partner, Chemical, but we can do it. Um, I think I think one of the keys here is that um, when these things evolve very quickly, as we articulated before, um, you, you rarely get the opportunity to carve things out. You actually, they want the whole asset, that being the company. You know, I think we, we if, if we look back, uh, the most likely scenario for us is that Pike Zone will lead to lead to basically a corporate takeover or a sales process whereby we're free to auction it, mm -hmm. bring in multiple parties to, to bid on it, and essentially the company is, is dissolved and moved on. Um, that's the likely scenario, but we can carve it out. 
we'll see where it goes. But often that doesn't happen. Usually they take out the whole company. So if all goes really well, the company potentially disappears this year at a substantially higher price because the big guys are not going to wait. And if things go a little slower, you may have time to plan for a spin out of all the other assets and for then the eventual takeover of the West MacArthur by a producer. I've been talking with Corey Bielik of Can Alaska Uranium at the Metals Investor Forum in Vancouver. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, John. Real pleasure.